Jonathan Kelly. Are you on the phone? Yeah, Kelly. Kelly also is here. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Seven. All right, so we're just waiting for one more to join us so we can get started. Chris, you make out okay in the storm? We did. We were very lucky because we're on the East Coast. So <laughs> instead of getting a direct hit, we had a, only a Cat 1 equivalent here. Um, we had lots of tornadoes, though. It was pretty scary. But uh, we came through okay, just some minor tree stuff. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, it looks like we have Greg on the line now as well. Uh, so, can you guys still see my screen? We can. Or okay. I can. Yep. All right, that's good. Uh, I think it's. Uh, of course, due to the, uh, the wonders of GoToMeeting, half the screen is covered by the stupid widget. All right, let me let me close that and we'll go back into present mode and we'll uh, hit the agenda. All right, so this is our agenda for today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, on the agenda today, we've got the usual HackFest planning, so we're gearing up for the Chicago HackFest. And I take it Tracy will cover that. Um, planning for the Lisbon Hackfest, I assume that we'll have a registration link up soon. Um, then uh, we have a proposal for Hyperledger Interledger Java that we'll go through. And Tracy, did we get somebody to present that? Uh, so I'm not sure if anybody's on the line or not, Chris. Okay. Yes, Adrian Hope Bailey here from Ripple, and I think some of my colleagues from uh, Everest are also on the line. Great. Okay, excellent, excellent. And then uh, the project reporting discussion. Is there anything else people would like to have on the agenda today? Okay, if not, let's uh, kick it off. So Tracy, over to you. All right, thanks Chris. So uh, HackFast uh, is coming up uh, next week in Chicago. So if you have not registered yet and you're planning on attending, uh, this is pretty much your, your last call for uh, registration. And then uh, if you are attending and you'd like to add to the agenda, we do have a draft agenda that's available uh, for people to add topics that they'd like to discuss. And then as Chris mentioned, uh, we are working on the, the final details for the Lisbon Hackfest and, and making sure that we have information about uh, places that people can stay uh, before we bring up the registration site, um, but expect that to be showing up very, very soon. What's the registration count at this point for Chicago? I checked it yesterday. It was 104 uh, people have wow. registered for Chicago. So yeah, okay. good crowd. Amazing. Yeah, that's good. Um, and uh, just as a reminder to people, um, you know, we put the agenda link up and basically we try and, um, you know, sort of crowdsource and then have, you know, essentially an unconference format. Um, but uh, as Brian and I um, have both um, made note of in the past, what we'd like to do with this one is have it be a little bit more hacking and a little bit more less yakking. Um, and uh, um, and so um, you know, getting some items up where you know teams are maybe planning on getting together and doing a little bit of experimentation, exploration into how we might get some chocolate into the other team's peanut butter um, and make some Reese's cups would be uh, preferable to having uh, a bunch of dog and pony. It doesn't mean we can't have any. Um, presentations, any, uh, you know, sort of more discussion type topics, but, um, right, yeah, <laughs> not a yak fest. Um, uh, but again, we'd really like to have uh, things be a little bit more about what 
can we actually do to, you know, encourage um, uh, integration and or interoperability across the different projects, uh, between the different projects. Um, and, uh, and if the, you know, people need to have a working group meeting and then preferably those are done, uh, not at the Hackfest it, itself, but maybe during a call in the week and then they can get together and have some other discussions and so forth. But again, less try, try not to have it such that we are essentially taking away from the opportunity to get together and, and actually, uh, uh, you know, have much, much more of a integration dialogue, if you will, between the various projects than um, uh, than we have in the past. Hey, um, Chris, could we possibly yep. do something like not schedule meetings during the afternoon then? Or just yeah, that's, I, I think that, yeah, I think that is likely to be uh, one way of approaching it. Um, what has happened in the past is just everyone wants to have a meeting and the yes, uh, and agenda just fills up. Um, right, so I think, exactly. Yeah, everybody wants to go to the identity meeting and, um, right, exactly. Yeah, I agree with Arno who just commented that no real hacking will happen spontaneously. So I agree. I think we probably, if we want this to happen, we should probably say, you know, after lunch, you know, we, we don't have meetings and presentations. Um, or something like that, or maybe before lunch, or however we want to do it. Um, because I think otherwise we will just, you know, we'll get scheduled bloat, which, uh, which yeah. kind of always happens. We always say we want to do more hacking, and then we never get to it because, you know, the meeting's just kind of... Because there's a meeting, right, and nobody wants to miss the meeting. Right. right. So I think if if we want to do this, we should... I mean, uh, there's just a suggestion. I mean, there could be other ways of doing this, but I think we need to have some kind of firm structure in place to enable this to happen. I don't think it will happen if we just give it lip service. Can I uh, propose, well, there's two, two thoughts I have. One is um, there are likely going to be people who show up who are, are you know, still on the, on the learning curve when it comes to the different technologies. Um, different projects, and so it's still, I think, useful not to have a um, not to have a meeting, but to make sure there's folks available who can help new devs up that learning curve. Um, uh, so just want to create space for that, recognizing folks like that will show up. Um, <clears throat> and then secondly, I remember mentioning to Chris, um, wouldn't it be interesting to have as part of like a structured recommendation, um, a mandate that says, you know, if your chosen project is Fabric, your job or uh, one of your goals at the Access should be to come up to speed and get a running instance of another project at, at Hacker Ledger, right? Um, to intentionally dive into, you know, if your project is Fabric, to dive into Burrow or dive into Sawtooth or Indy. Um, and and uh, work with the folks there who showed up from those projects, but but let them also then dive into your project, right? Um, and it might not be pushing the envelope forward on hacking and, and knocking out Jira defects and that sort of thing, but it might really help with the um, conversation about cross project you know integration. Thanks, Brian. Any more on the Hackfest? Not a Yakfest. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is the Interledger proposal, Interledger Java. Um, can somebody paste the link into the chat so that others have it? And then we'll uh, go through. And is there anybody who would like to uh, take the presentation mode? Uh, to present anything specific. Hi, this is Adrian. So um, we haven't prepared anything specific in terms of a presentation. Um, my understanding was that we should join the call and talk through the proposal document with the members yeah, of the TSC. That, that's fine. If you want to do that, we can we can do that. You can just Tracy, maybe um, you can just. Uh, have the proposal up and then scroll through as they need. 
All right, thanks. So, so, um, so my name is Adrian. Uh, I work at Ripple. Um, the Interledger product project uh, started at Ripple. It's it is a W3C community group project and is focused on development of a protocol. Uh, the group's been in existence getting close to two years now, and one of the challenges we've had as a standards group is that we're building a lot of reference code and uh, this was not an obvious place where this code could be developed and maintained and fall into a framework of good governance and contributor management and so on. So uh, about a year ago, we joined the JS Foundation and a huge chunk of our reference code, which is JavaScript code, it's uh, in a separate project called Interledger JS at the JS Foundation. Uh, now, obviously, because Interledger is a, a protocol, uh, there are other implementations starting to um, be developed. And, and probably about 18 months ago, uh, we started looking at a Java implementation. I've done some work on it personally, as well as a number of colleagues from, from Ripple. But uh, our colleagues from Everest and NTT Tacoma uh, started <clears throat> contributing a great deal to the Java implementation. And that's evolved quite nicely to the point that we thought it was a good time for that to also find a home and have a project where that could continue to evolve as a, a, a Java stack that is focused on interoperability between uh, distributed ledger or ledger systems at least not just distributed ledgers so that's that's really the the background um, interledger itself is a fairly simple um, protocol it establishes a, a global namespace for accounts value holding accounts or digital asset accounts um, and it establishes a simple protocol for what you could think of as synchronized atomic swaps between different um, different systems. So uh, it, it establishes a standard for the condition um, that you would use in like a hash time lock uh, contract, or, or as we call them more abstractly, a hash time lock agreement, and uh, and what the um, fulfillment of that condition would look like. By putting this all together, we able to perform what are in effect uh, payments or transfers of value across multiple systems uh, that integrate together. So to address some of the key questions, I think, which have come up in the document, uh, yes, uh, Interledger is, a, is, is primarily a payments protocol. So while there are a number of systems um, or projects within the Hyperledger, uh, um, under the Hyperledger umbrella that are not payments focused, they're uh, Turing complete smart contract systems. Interledger is primarily primarily about integrating those systems um, for the purpose of transferring, you know, value that is underwritten on those systems. Um, so it's it's not clear, or it certainly hasn't been explored, uh, how this might apply to other things. Um, another question was asked around Lightning. So you know, how similar is this to Lightning? And and I think uh, it's intentionally quite similar. It has a number of, it's, I would call it an abstraction uh, above what the Lightning Network is in that it, um, the, the, the condition that we use for our contracts is, is similar so that a Lightning Network could form part of a group of networks integrated with Interledger. Um, but it, it's sort of an overlay on top of that. So you, you could have a Lightning Network as well as another network underpinned for example, by uh, Indy or Burrow, and another network and then by um, you know a traditional payment system, and you could integrate all three of those um, using the Interledger protocol. I think that's the gist of the the, the main comments I've seen. But uh, my colleagues from uh, Isaac uh, Arabera from uh, Everest who's been the main proposer is unfortunately unable to make the call, but I know some of his colleagues are on the line uh, and may also have some things to add. Juan Carlos, uh, are you uh, um, happy with my, with my presentation so far? Is there anything you want to add to that? 
Hello, I'm Juan Carlos from Everest. Uh, yeah, really, your explanation was uh, really good. I don't have anything to add. In that case, uh, any questions? Hi, this is uh, Dan Middleton. Uh, question on the uh, dependencies that this would imply on the um, on the existing blockchain frameworks or conversely whether the intent of this proposal is to provide uh, all the adaptations necessary and contained within the interledger project rather than um, implying new code on the uh, infrastructure projects right a great question thanks dan so there, there's been um two ways we've integrated with existing systems uh, to date. Uh, really, the, the one is if, if the system is able to evolve to adopt the standards we've defined for uh, the escrow or, or the, you know, the holes or whatever you want to call them, um, then it's, it's possible for that system to be, you know, it, we would call it natively supporting Interledger and you, and you could have um, very simple integration from what we would call a connector, so a system that that um, is accepting a transfer on one system and making a transfer on another as part of facilitating the end-to-end payment. The other way to do that is um, to write plugins um, that you that, that uh, are specific to that ledger, so they speak that ledger's protocol and they abstract away a lot of the, the detail. So we have a, I guess you could call it a spectrum of what we call hash time lock agreements. So you, you may be familiar with the concept of hash time lock contracts, which are part of uh, how Lightning works. Um, we have a documented sort of a spectrum of what we, we sort of call an abstraction of those, which are the agreements. And those vary from right on the extreme, you know, a system that natively supports these um, time lock contracts right across to one that doesn't, but where the two entities transacting across that system actually establish um, a, 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 an account with one another, some trust. And so well, the underlying system is underwriting that relationship, but the payments themselves can act, are actually just exchanged directly to the payment instructions. So, so there's a there's a full spectrum of those different um, agreements. And it's quite possible to implement Interledger over a system that has absolutely no sort of native support for it. In terms of the work that we intend to do in this project, um, to date, we've defined what we call the standard uh, ledger adapter interface, which, um, which we've implemented for the, uh, the reference ledger, we call the five belt ledger. So all of that have been implemented in, in this project already. The plan would be to catch up with some of the JavaScript reference implementations for existing ledgers, and then also to focus on um, ledger systems within the Hyperledger project that seem appropriate. So uh, that question was asked, you know, would we focus on all projects? How would we prioritize? Um, and I think that would come from the Hyperledger community in terms of their interest in, in uh, working with us to build that integration. So, um uh, again, I'm, I'm still not clear on the, the specific implementation. Uh, if, if, if I could, um, if, if, if you could take us a, 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 a another lower level. So from the intellectual point of view, as we said, this is implemented in Java. Mm -hmm. If we were to support that, say from Fabric, if we were to support this, would we then implement the plugin or the adapter that have been called, our connector that being called here in Java or the interface is, uh, or, or would the interface be REST or put above kind of interface that is language neutral? Right, so um, we're in the process of defining an over the wire interface, uh, so a binary interface that would be, um, you know, stack agnostic, would allow two entities to interface with one another uh, if, you know, one's Rust and one's Java or whatever the case may be. So our plan would be to implement that interface in Java and then be able to interface, uh, to interact or connect with 
um, another entity that could be implemented in something else, so some of the existing JavaScript implementations. For the underlying ledger system, um, it's possible to do nothing, um, but it's possible for us to, um, if the ledger system itself uh, wants to support this concept of escrow, then it could build that into the ledger itself. But as I understand the Fabric uh, project, for example, it's a, it's a smart contract system. So one would imagine that if you were using Fabric as the underlying ledger between two nodes, so you have two entities on the interledger who are transacting with one another and Fabric is uh, underpinning that, then I would expect that there would be a contract written that runs within Fabric that is specific to that relationship. And that contract would um, be some sort of uh, value transfer contract that encapsulates the, the interledger logic around escrow and it would be written to use the same um, right. expiries and contract um, you know, triggers and so on as, as we've standardized on. Right, right, thank you. That, by the way, that is exactly how we've implemented um, our uh, proof of concept of Ethereum. Okay. So in the case of the, <clears throat> sorry, in the case of, um, you know, just, I'm thinking about the the kind of four main platforms that we have right now are five if you, you know, uh, if we extend Burroughs out to a platform. Um, all of them are very general um, in the semantics that they have um, and that they use. Um, I mean, I could imagine one way that 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 the that a plugin becomes and <clears throat> just to talk on on Sawtooth terms, it becomes kind of a library that you could add to to a transaction family that would support the appropriate um, kind of escrow capabilities. But how do you imagine Interledger playing with these others that are more general purpose? Um, uh, is it just a subset of usages or is this a general purpose facility that, that um, I, 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 I'm just having a hard time kind of wrapping my brain around what it means to incorporate Interledger. Right, so so as I said, we, we haven't explored anything beyond the value transfer use case. That, that was really what Interledger was designed for. So for a general purpose system, if that general purpose system is being used to um, underwrite some sort of value, you know, a token's been issued and that's been passed around or whatever the case may be, then it, then I think the use of Interledger is fairly straightforward. The, the, the way value is transferred on that system, um, if it's designed to have a two-phase transfer where uh, it can be put into an escrow with a time limit and then released given a cryptographic key and those follow the interledger standards so the you know the the key is a is the pre-image of a sha-256 hash then it's very straightforward how you would use that system if you have something a more generic use case um, that's to be honest not something we've really explored and, and I'm hoping that's something we can dig into as part of this project is to understand where the same principles um, could be applied for you know for new use cases that are not specific to value transfer. Um, yeah, I think I the comment that I added the comment that I added to the document was basically something about is there a way to generalize this to a kind of multi ledger atomic commit, um, which is I mean that's essentially what you're doing um, with the with the escrow on it. Okay, guys, this is, uh, right. Stephen, this is Stephen also from, from Ripple. I'm one of the co-authors of the white paper. Um, just wanted to, to comment on that a little bit. So uh, the way that we look at it, this fitting into sort of a larger transaction system um, is whenever you want to make a transaction, you want to move assets around, um, you really don't want to care which uh, ledgers these assets are on because they could be on different ledgers. And at that point, you need to figure out how do you uh, find liquidity between those ledgers, someone has to take the risk of converting one asset for another. Um, and so if you're writing a contract, let's say I owe you $100, ideally you would be able to code that contract and say like, I pay you $100 without having to care uh, which ledgers we use respectively and uh, which connectors are out there that are providing liquidity between those ledgers. 
Um, so IntelliJ is intentionally designed with these hash time lock agreements so that it can tie into a higher level contract because that higher level contract can then acknowledge receipt of the funds with this hash lock um, and then execute the payment. So um, I would also refer to uh, a spec that we've uh, written at the um, and introduced at the ITF uh, called Crypto Conditions, which I believe has been referenced in the uh, quarter white paper as well as in the uh, chain white paper. Um, so I, I'd also point to that as something that could be a primitive to tie these different systems together. Thank you. Yeah, so, so one of the first things we actually implemented within the project is a, a Java implementation of crypto conditions. Um, if you'd like, I'll try and find a link to the IETF um, internet draft quickly, um, and I can post that in. I, I would like to see that, yes. Thank you. So this is good. I was actually, this is Arno, I was going to ask you what the status of the spec is, because I remember you guys started looking into the Dart 3 c to evolve the spec and then figured, well, it's a protocol, it belongs more to IETF. So how much progress have you made on that front? Hey Arno, um, so, so we continue to operate under um, the umbrella of a W3C community group. Um, and, and I guess part of the challenge we have is that there's so many streams of work going on. Um, as I say, we've, we've got um, code, uh, you know, code, uh, we're writing open source code and that needs a home. And then we've got a bunch of sort of branches of where this work is going. So on the one hand, um, there's work going on to figure out how Interledger would be applicable in the web payments work. And that's very, you know, that's very applicable at W3C. On the other hand, there's more generic primitives like crypto conditions, which we've um, presented at IETF and uh, are planning to be in Singapore um, later in, in November as well to, to potentially um, provide an update there. We also did a box at IETF in Berlin, a, a Birds of a Feather session where we presented Interledger. There was a lot of interest. Um, the challenge we have is that the, the attendees at IETF, the, the companies that attend, are not um, the same people who are interested in Interledger. So whereas it's kind of, it's an appropriate type of audience, it's the wrong companies or people involved. And so we're trying to build up some momentum around the project to either attract those uh, people, so people from the companies that are you know, Hyperledger members, as an example of a, of a set of companies who'd be interested in you know, contributing um, to IETF, or, or finding an alternative place where some of these standards could be established. Okay, thank you. I can understand the challenge of finding the right venue for this. Okay, so the Interledger project is totally led by the W3C now. So if we accept uh, uh, it as a Hyperledger project, uh, how would those two uh, two organizations collaborate with each other? What's your expectation? Uh, which which two organizations are you referring to? <clears throat> the Hyperledger community and the W3C, yeah. So right. I can give you a bit more background if I can interject because I'm very familiar yeah. with that part. The W3C community groups really are just public forums. They are they pro, they they are not official work within the W3C. Correct. Right. So, so the W3C provides a framework for us. It it provides us with a mailing list, a blog. It, um, it it helps us to establish contributor agreements. So everyone who joins the group is by default um, had to sign the contributor agreement. And it basically just protects the standards development work that's going on in that group from uh, you know from malicious actors. It's it's not it's not um, in any way putting us by it doesn't by default put us on a standards track within W3C. So as I said, right. there's streams of work that we're busy with that may be appropriate at W3C, and we're in the process of building up the charter for the web payments working group where some aspects of the interledger work may fall into that. And that would be specific to payments in browsers. 
So it's very different, for example, to what we're you know working on at a in a generic protocol definition uh, sort of forum. Uh, on, on the other hand, you know, we have something like the crypto conditions draft, which we presented at IETF. And for that to become a standard track document, we would need to attract a number of other people interested in forming a work group around that work and, and progressing it. And, and at the moment, um, we, we haven't been able to find people at IETF who, who are already attending IETF who ha have an interest in that. So this is part of, you know, the process that's going on now is to find uh, other interested parties in the work and, and find a forum that we all agree is the correct place to take the work. Uh, so I guess the um, risk to introduce those uh, conflicts among those uh, different organizations, right? I, I, I missed that. Sorry, there were a few people talking over each other. If, if we uh, make the project under the umbrella of uh, different pro organizations, there will be some risk uh, uh, to introduce uh, the conflicts. Sure, but the, the the focus within Hyperledger specifically is we want to we want to have an open source software project. So the the, the deliverables of this project will be software um, code. And, and the, um, the intention or the goal is develop code that's used for interoperability between these ledger systems. And the, um, today, the plan is for that code to be an implementation of the interledger protocol. Um, you would have seen the discussion on the mailing list with Brian around uh, um, naming, and, and I think part of the intention around picking a generic name like Hyperledger Quilt, which I think is the, where we settled, is that you know we're going to start this um, project on a roadmap of we want to interoperate these systems. And right now, the how we do that is Interledger, but that could evolve over time. And and the specific deliverables will just be you know will be code, will be will be Java intent is the intent today, um, code for for doing providing that interoperability. In terms of the actual protocol itself, that's not happening within this Hyperledger group. The development of the protocol itself is happening within the W3C group today and could happen also in the future. But obviously, our hope is that if people are getting involved in Hyperledger quilts, they'll take an interest in the, you know, the evolution of the protocol itself and, and contribute to that as well. Okay, thanks. So, Adrian, speaking of Quilt, is that the name that we're ending up with? <laughs> I know there was an awful lot of discussion around the name. It seems like it. We, we, have a chat. <laughs> so we have a we have a biweekly we have a biweekly call. Um, the Everest guys and and myself and some of the guys at Ripple mm -hmm. and and other contributors and we had one yesterday and that seems to be the name we've everyone settled on. Um, it's it's kind of the the least likely to cause friction, I think, was was probably mm -hmm. where we ended up. Uh, and and what I'm gonna, what I agree to do is I'll, I'll get our design team at Ripple to see if they can um, put some ideas together for some sort of branding around it. Because we did the same for the Interledger JS project. Um, we took the same color schemes from the Interledger logo <laughs> and produced a new Interledger JS sort of logo and so on. And 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 that helps to sort of provide an idea of, of what the the brand, if you like, will look like on the project. So so we're gonna do I'm gonna do that this week and see if I can um, share something uh, next week on, on what that might look like. Okay. And just out of curiosity, I, have you guys talked at all to Stellar and uh, we have not that I know of. We've we've had a lot of interactions with a lot of the other blockchain projects, um, mm -hmm. as well as non-blockchain payments payments uh, um, businesses. You'll um, you'll have likely seen we had a workshop in Berlin uh, earlier this year where we did a big demo and we had people from Zcash and. Um, Fury and so on there, and we did a, a, a payment that went over Interledger, went used Interledger to pass over Ethereum, Bitcoin, 
uh, XRP, etc. So, um, you know, we, we we're not intentionally excluding anybody, but uh, we've you know we've basically been engaging whoever we have the resources um, to engage and anyone who's shown an interest in participating. Um, but as yet, I'm not aware of anyone who's built a stellar integration. Or they certainly, if they have, no one's um, brought it to the group. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the resourcing? Uh, I, I appreciated seeing that there was some full-time commitment of resources. Uh, when I went and looked at the activity on the existing uh, GitHub project, it wasn't obvious to me though if, if that was going to be an uptake in resourcing or if those individuals were already active on there. Uh, right, so I'll, I'll have to ask Juan Carlos to comment from Everest side, um, but from Ripple side, we have a number of, no, no one at Ripple is on this full time, although we have at last count four engineers who are all contributing, uh, myself included. Um, so that's, that's sort of the where things sit with Ripple. I, I, I think my last uh, conversation with Isak, I understood that there was going to be some full-time uh, commitment from some engineers that side, but I know Juan Carlos can add color to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, from the every side, originally there was just uh, Enrique, who is our lead architect, who I think is in this call as well, and, and me. Uh, but from our side, we're, we're also planning on bringing in people from Latin America, from Japan, from, from a, f a few different offices, good engineers as well. I don't have any specifics yet, but I can tell you like maybe increase the team in Everest by 10, 20 people is the objective. Okay, that's that's interesting. Maybe the proposal could be uh, amended a little bit so it's it's more clear on the engineering because at least at the moment it says pretty directly that, that the Ripple engineering would be full time. That's kind of the, the read on the, the list of names there. I think you, you know, between all of the um, engineers at Ripple, you probably end up with just over the equivalent of one full time, or maybe one and a half. But that's probably going to fluctuate. Okay, and then um, when we look at the activity on the existing GitHub project, um, it doesn't look. Uh, as active as what what that num many engineers would would maybe imply. So is yeah, this that, 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 there would definitely be an uptick, and I and we've gone through a fairly quiet phase at the moment where a lot of our energy has been um, looking at the protocol stuff. And and uh, to be honest, the the when that's happening. The, majority of the proof of concept work is happening in the JavaScript stack and then we re-implement that in Java sort of once it's once it's settled. So we have gone through a bit of a lull of late. I'm hoping that if we can, you know, if we can find more contributors on the, the Java implementation, we can even, you know, use that to POC some of the ideas or even be, you know, at least be on feature parity with the JavaScript stack and potentially even exploring new things uh, in, the, in the Java stack that, that haven't even, um, uh, that, that are not in the JavaScript stack at all. And where's the JavaScript stack um, held? It's in a GitHub project. Uh, I think the GitHub group is just called IntelliJS. If you just go to github.com slash IntelliJS. Okay. Is that under a similar kind of yep. governance that, quandary that, right now? That whole, everything in there is um, actually also part of Linux Foundation under the JS Foundation. Oh, that's right. You did mention that up front. Yeah. yeah. So, so we'd is, like, I mean, we'd like obviously other implementations to, to follow us in the path where they have a, you know, they form part of a project that has a governance model and, you know, contributor management and, standardized licensing and all of those kind of things. Anyway, GitHub activity might be a little bit deceptive because a few of the developers like to 
to develop a first on their own personal GitHub and then uh, fork out to to the main one. So you might see some collaborations which are like uh, just one commit, but might might be a thousand lines, stuff like that. Okay, thanks. Hello, I'm Enrique from Everest. Uh, I just would like to add that from our Everest side, there is also some other groups that are already working with Iparleya technology. Well, in fact, I think Entity Data is that is our uh, other company, let's say, is already part of uh, Iparleya. And I cannot say for sure how many people are really working we are already working on Hyperlayer because we are more than 18,000 18, employers. So I don't know what's the, the activity of all the group. But I, I know for sure that there is already people working on, on Hyperlayer. So it will be interesting from our side to, to just make ILP work uh, just for business, uh, for business, for our home business interest. So that's all. Okay, so thinking again on, on the different aspects of uh, the, the JavaScript project being elsewhere and, and the need to find a home for the, the Java project, I'm not clear if, if the goal in bringing that project under a Hyperledger umbrella is to have a governance model over code that is going to prioritize existing payment networks like Bitcoin and so forth, or if the goal is to bring it under Hyperledger so that you can integrate Hyperledger um, stacks. Or there's other possible answers to that question, of course. So, so from, from, my, from my perspective, the goal is more generic, but I think the reality will be determined by who wants to contribute to the project. Yeah. So um, the JS Foundation is actually a project under the Linux Foundation. Um, although I think maybe it's managed by the. I, 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 That's correct. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, you know, I suppose that, it, you know, it, it might actually make sense to sort of, because their, you know, their focus is obviously JavaScript um, and. Uh, and not other languages that maybe it might actually make sense to sort of have that project come over here so that it's side by side so that you just have different implementations of essentially the same thing and it's easier to sort of keep things sorted out in a single place. It, I think Dan, you know, is highlighting an important aspect of all of this is that um, ideally, instead of being skeptical scattered all over, there's some sort of uh, focal point for the work itself, and then that might actually help to draw more attention and more uh, participation than, <clears throat> uh, you know, and providing the forum that I think you guys are actually looking for. Yeah, I, I hadn't considered that as an option. Um, I, I would be interested to hear what the JS Foundation guys would think of, of that. Yeah, I think that's something that Brian could talk to Chris about, maybe. And uh... and and you know, I I, um, I didn't want to you know tie this to that. Uh, I've, you know, no, I I'm, I'm not trying right, to Brian. Just you know, as a positive yeah. experience. I figured if we did if we brought this in as a positive experience, then that's the basis for for going and seeing if there was interest there. Um, uh, but you know, it also seems to be happy over there. So. Um, didn't, yeah, I, didn't I think, the, yeah, I think the one advantage of them being separate is that they can evolve um, separately. Uh, ultimately, I think we're getting to a point where the interledger protocol itself is going to stabilize and, and not change dramatically. And then the reference implementations will have some core code libraries that, you know, are not changing dramatically, but there'll be a great amount of energy into, uh, you know, periphery stuff like integrations into existing systems and so on and I think those are going to evolve separately I, I would be nervous about lumping the stacks together if that creates uh, an assumption that you know if someone's building a 
uh, fabric integration on the Java stack that that there's a need to have a fabric integration in the JavaScript stack as well. Um, I think that's probably not likely to happen, especially if they start to be tight integrations that are built in the technology of the of the stack itself of of the of the um, of the ledger stack. I mean. So one way, yeah, one one way I, I would like to see the, I mean, my my way I visualized this evolving was that you know Hyperledger Quilt is a project for interoperability of um, you know ledger systems, and it implements the interledger protocol, as opposed to it being this is an interledger project. It's a, it's it's another implementation of this protocol. Okay. Any other questions for Adrian and the and the others? Yes, it's uh, this is Bippin from uh, BNB. Go ahead. Um, so we spoke uh, briefly about the split, meaning one, you know, the Hyperledger project, um, the interledger was supposed to be inside Hyperledger, and the deliverable would be a code base. And then for standard purposes, you will be uh, housed under IETF. Um, we also have some working groups under uh, Hyperledger that is supposed to be cross-cutting uh, and uh, providing a guidance at least on standards uh, for all the projects that are being um, under the umbrella of Hyperledger. So uh, how would that operate uh, with respect, how would the interledger operate with respect to, uh, you know, this, this split which, which you had envisaged and how, how would uh, you interoperate with, uh, you know, the working group, working groups in Hyperledger? So, uh, so I see two interactions there. If I understand the the question correctly, there's a interaction between this project and other hyperledger projects, and there's an interaction between this project and whichever um, home we find for the standards development. On the first, I think um, I I think it will be a valuable two-way interaction where the existing um, projects can provide. Uh, input into into this project on how their systems work and where um, you know what we're doing is applicable and also you know assist in developing integrations for those projects uh, you know and it, 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 I'm hoping that you know contributors from those projects will actually contribute into this as well and say well we, we quite like the idea of an integration for fabric or for you know burrow so we'll actually contribute the code that that provides the plugin or the adapter or whatever model um, we go with to do that on the other hand the interaction with the standards body I think would also be uh, a two-way thing in that you know the standard is being established within that community um, around how the protocol works and you know other aspects, uh, standardized aspects of, of Interledger itself. But there's also got to be feedback from implementers uh, and from implementations that say, well, we've tried implementing this and it's actually problematic for these reasons because when we integrate, you know, Fabric and Burrow for this specific use case, um, this aspect of the standard is problematic. And, and that, that should also feed back into the protocol development work as well. And, and I mean, those have been tightly coupled um, processes today so we've had you know a very it, it's, it's quite a strong overlap of people who are building the implementation and working on the protocol and so it's been a pretty tight feedback loop obviously as the pro project has matured and we we end up with more and more implementations that becomes more disparate and, and we'll have to manage that um, but that that's certainly mine 
my hope is that everybody who takes into ledger and says, I want to build an implementation of this, um, I have a use case in mind or something specific I want to do with it, that as they do that, they feed back into you know the community and say, well, you know, this doesn't work or this does work, or here's the suggestion to make things better. Thanks. I think uh, you know overall this is a, a welcome development uh, because as users, not the developers of the of the DLTs, uh, we have an interest in promoting uh, interoperability and some of the some of the questions especially around identity uh, will be um, you know because because that is needs to be nailed down as to how the process the DLT boundaries uh, I know that you guys you know you you have a pretty simple uh, definition of certain things and that is great because you know with a simple escrow uh, or, or time lock mechanism uh, you know being able to cross DLTs is a wonderful thing yeah I, I think I think that, I think that 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 process or that time lock um, process can be applied across many transactions. It doesn't have to just be payments, as Stefan alluded to before, and and it also provides a great primitive on which you can build smart contracts and so on. So so I I really I'm I'm hopeful that by bringing this into Hyperledger we can explore that stuff more deeply. Certainly, you know, we've had a payments focus because those that that's driven by the nature of the contributors to the community to date. Um, that doesn't preclude that from becoming an important part of the work going forward. Well, in the in the classic model, uh, if you just um, if you can just model a um, identity and an asset, uh, then you can have start have, having transactions um, between identities of assets. And since cash is a special asset, and since this whole thing started out with cryptocurrency, that's why I think we see the bias towards, you know, the payments or the currencies. Uh, but a generic model of asset uh, will not be that far off because we have this uh, generic smart contract languages, which which will end up having to model an asset anyway to do anything useful. So uh, even though they do not have embedded um, cryptocurrencies, uh, this will still uh, can be built on top of all that anyway. So I think this is not the easiest setup for sure because you have basically a W3C working group developing a spec that gets published in IETF and implemented in JavaScript with the JS Foundation and now an implementation in Java with the Hyperledger. But this being said, my experience is, you know, those groups have an inherent interest to keep all this in, in place, especially Ripple. And so if Ripple's you know, if Ripple is involved in all of this, uh, this separate effort, I think they will keep it together. Um, and, you know, I, I do think there is a natural interaction that happens between implementers and the spec writers. And, you know, as long as they share the same interest and there is enough overlap in participation in the different groups, that could actually work out pretty well. Or not, we all went through the web services silliness. So. Yeah, <laughs> there are horror <laughs> stories that for sure we could <laughs> refer to, you know, that didn't work so well. But I have, you know. I have lots of scars from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, okay. So, I, and, and uh, it was noted by Nick that was very nice to for <laughs> Not sure. It, it doesn't sound that good, though. Um, <laughs> But uh, so so, what do people think? Are we are we at a point where people have exhausted the Q and A and we can move on, or do people need a little bit more time to noodle and think about this and discuss it? Or so there is one thing that I think is important, and I was browsing through the document. I mean, 
I see the word standard, you know, repeated over and over when in fact there is no standard per se, right? So I understand that's the intent, but uh, we might be a bit more careful. Standards professional might get offended by your overuse of a term that's not quite right. But beyond that, I think what's important is whether, you know, what is, is what is the dependency? Is the charter basically going to be, we're stuck to the spec, whatever the spec, is is gold or does the you know the documents specifically say that's the starting point the aim is to keep working in sync with the spec but you know we are free to diverge if we feel like it and this is brian i think i think the projects need the freedom um to be able to make decisions about the spec especially in the as i mentioned on email and kind of the case of a contentious fork um uh, and that's one reason to give it a name that is independent of interledger, even if everybody knows, you know, just like the Apache web server, everyone knew it would be an implementation of HTTP, right? Unless things went really, really south at the IETF with HTTP. And yet the Apache web server developers had the freedom to decide how quickly do they want to implement parts of HTTP? Uh, do they push back on certain things? So, you know, you can be a an implementation, perhaps even considered one of the reference implementations, and not be, you know, uh, feel like you're serving two masters, if you will. Um, I kind of feel like this project and its maintainers need the autonomy to be able to decide which standards out there um, they they implement. And it may be that there are two standards, you know, implementing in the same code base, Interledger and Lightning, <laughs> makes sense or something like that um at least from as a as the executive director I'm wearing my hat that's how i kind of view it and the fact that there's a lot of overlap between the w3c group and this one um is is fine uh, and doesn't mean that the project serves two masters i agree with you brian and that's what i was trying to get to is i think the document the proposal should make that clear I also quickly want to mention that as Ripple, we're also not married to Interledger. If, if a better protocol comes out or if something else gets more traction, uh, we're more than happy to, to put our weight behind that. Um, we're mostly trying to do this as a way to you know, put some effort into uh, trying to design a protocol, but again, we're not married to it uh, long term. Uh, yeah, Definitely. hopefully we, we can have, take a few things like, to the mail list. Uh, it sounds like we still have some open discussion. I, I, in particular, would like to hear a little bit more clarity on the maintainer's intent. The document itself talks about Hyperledger project interaction, but it seems most of the discussion has been about um, the original premises of, of payment networks that, that are outside of Hyperledger. Uh, and I don't think either answer is is right or wrong, but I would like to hear a, a consistent and clear answer on the maintainer's goals. Okay. As a process check, it kind of sounds like um, we're not ready to vote this week. Um, right. uh, not sure if we're ready to have a, a vote next week, given we'll be at the Hackfest at the same time as uh, the usual time for the TSC call. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe we we should decide offline if we want to have a TSC call during the Hackfest and vote on this issue, or if we want to delay it by two more weeks. It sounds like most people are positive. There's just some, some I think, adjustments to the proposal folks would, would be more comfortable with. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to take it from here. Yeah, so I was just, uh, I, I think I think that makes sense. I don't know if we're going to have a call or not. I mean, we were trying to discourage everybody else from having calls. <laughs> Um, but um, maybe maybe we should. Uh, I don't I don't know, Stefan and and Adrian and others. Are you guys planning on attending the Hackfest? Not in Chicago, no. Unfortunately, um, I'm I'm in San Francisco for a short time, and then I'm actually based in Cape Town. I'll be I'll be back in Cape Town soon. Okay. Um, well then, uh, yes. Yeah, so let's. Let, let me take a look at what we have in the agenda. Um, it may make sense to have a maybe a half a call next week. But usually we sleep on such, such things. We do sleep, I'm you sorry. know. When the uh, proposal is uh, presented, normally the we do kind of let it, you know, people sleep on it a little bit before they vote. Yes. Yeah, we've done that for the most part in almost every case. So let's um, 
let me, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll think about, you know, next week and look at the agenda and see if we have time to, to fit in a call, Brian. Um, and, uh, but we can also vote via email. So I think, as Dan suggested, taking it to the mailing list and, and uh, potentially updating the, uh, uh, the proposal based on the, the comments and the feedback and the questions. Um, that are asked that were asked today, and 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 maybe we can be in a place where we can we can vote on it by email or in, in, over a quick call. Does that make sense? If so, and since we ran out of time, Tracy doesn't have to do any more work. <laughs> and uh, I think we'll call it a call it a week. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.